Hey, uh, let's do this. Why don't, we, why don't we dive into our story? You know, it's fun to talk. I mean, we, we, we've known each other for a long time. A long time. Long time. Yes. So Phyllis and I actually met. Uh, we actually met when she was 14 and I was 15. Uh, we, I met her on the way to youth, at youth camp. And so uh, I think you've got a better perspective because we just happened to meet there, but you had heard about me before. So sure. How do we... I, um, well, at 14, I was saved at 12, but at 14, I, my sister attended uh, the, a non-denominational church and she wanted me to come and visit. And um, so I came to a Christmas program and she, and she said, hey, I want you to meet, a few, she wanted me to meet, to meet a few of the youth that were in leadership and knew everyone, you know, she was trying to get me connected. And so Steve was there, Pastor Steve, and so I actually met him first and a few other people, yes. And uh, I don't know, Jim must have been in the Christmas program or something. I don't know where he was, but I didn't get a chance to meet him. Um, And so I would try to come to youth group uh, when I could and... uh, but then a summer camp was coming, and so my sister was like, why don't you go to summer camp? You need to go. And, uh, and I didn't know anyone, and Steve was actually going on a mission trip, and he said, well, I'll introduce you to my twin brother. Come on. He'll, he'll take care of you. I will he'll... take care of you, girl. <laughs> I was like hey, not prepared. I thought the prepared. ownership and the responsibility. I was trying I to go to church camp. I didn't I... want to let nobody down. He was trying to be a good host. That's right. And so uh, anyway, so just going to, I don't even know what happened, but going to to summer camp, we just really connected. For me, it was the first time that I had been introduced to the Holy Spirit, first time that I really felt the presence of God, really connected with God that week, and then also met this amazing guy. Like, what a good week, right? Right. (laughs) I'm like, he's so sweet. He loves Jesus. Like, it was great. It was awesome. Yeah, no, and yes. so we, we dated then for just over a year. Yep. And, uh, and it, it was long distance. It was long distance. I, had li- I lived actually probably about 35 minutes away, which I don't know why. Maybe it seemed so long because we didn't drive. Yeah, so it seemed drive. like two hours away, but it was really long Well, like and that it. was back when you had area codes that charged you more to be on the phone. You know, you know what I'm talking long about? Long distance calling. So it was like 49 cents a minute. Yes, we had to ask permission. Like Mom? I had to ask permission yeah. to hey, call him. Hey, can I him. call Phyllis today? She's like, well, you did it yesterday. Five minutes. You got Five minutes, yeah, five, babe. Minutes. five minutes. And then you used to have the phone cords. Do you guys remember the phone cord that stretched all the way into the other room? Yes. Because you mine didn't want nobody to hear? Yes, yeah. and mine was in the kitchen. So yeah. I had to stretch we it all too. the way down the hall to the bedroom and shut We the shut door. the bathroom. We'd have to stretch from the kitchen into the bathroom. That's right. Hey. Yes. And then someone yes. knocked. It's been five minutes. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And then we had pagers and, you oh, know, yeah. just we to, had some to, codes. Right. We had some codes. I'm it, thinking about you, had to, you. You had to figure, yeah, you had to figure out the Morris code. I love you. Yes. Was it like 143 or something? We I had different numbers. And, I don't know. I don't know. But to think about just calling someone whenever you feel like it, I'm like, man, we, we really worked hard to stay yeah, we connected. Did. We actually wrote snail mail. Letters. I still have letters. 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 Love letters he sent me. Uh, yeah, yes. I love it. And, and I would mail it on Friday or Thursday. We would see each other on Sunday, and she would get it on Monday or Tuesday. So it was all old by then. I'd done seen her and loved on her and hugged her. And <laughs> told, told me everything <coughs> that was in the letter. Yeah. And uh, anyway, he wrote me a couple of poems. And yeah. So I still have Come those. On. Those are neat. Yeah. So we super w- romantic. Right. What? I, so good. Yeah, so super good. romantic until the next Yeah, well, about summer. a year later, I went on a mission trip and went to, uh, uh, I think they did Nicaragua. And uh, when I got back, long story short, when I got back, they, they did a whole session on just date Jesus. Don't, don't date someone that you're really not in the position to marry. Listen, I was 15. I'm not, I'm not moving towards marriage. And so they really talked about getting your heart focused on God. So when I came back... You know, you've been immersed in missions, love God, and uh, I... You were I, gone for a whole month. A whole month. Yes, and so I was, and he actually... You were waiting? Had, and waiting. He had gotten sick, and so yeah. as a church, we were praying for him. Like, I couldn't wait to see him. I was so excited. And then when I saw him at church, yeah. he, he just acted weird, and I was like, what is his deal? And I broke up with you. Yeah. And <laughs> then church, I asked him, hey, the what's wrong? We talked about this. And so I remember exactly where I was standing when I broke up with you. Yes. And I, I didn't even do a good job. I'm like, we should got to break up. <laughs> and so I was so nervous that if we talked, she would talk me out of it. Because I really loved her. It had nothing. I mean, if I could tell you, she really was. I told her stepdad that I was going to marry her. And so we had been pure. 
we had Christian friends. Like we, we really were working hard to make this a godly relationship. And so when I came back and I had to break up, it was really tough. Like I, I really felt in the depth of my soul, I was going to marry this girl, I loved her. And so it was hard. So I broke up with her and then I walked off. And what, what happened from there? Yes. And uh, so I, I know we, we've joked about it a couple of times, but I was really, I was really devastated. I was hurt. Like it was, it was actually probably my first boyfriend. I had a lot of boys at school. I felt like I got a, you know, lots of attention in Valentine's and stuff in elementary school. Like, yeah. you know, but this was really my first boyfriend Seriously. that I had trusted. Right. And not only that, like, I, I felt he was all wrapped in Jesus. Like, I mean, you Just know, wrapped up in Jesus. I know I was I know. so, so anyways, but I was really hurt. I felt rejected by him. I felt rejected by God. And so that part of it, that was, that was hurtful for me. Yeah. So why don't you talk about, so, so let me tell you a little bit about from that moment on, I stayed in church. Uh, I remember a couple of times she came to church and some, some, you know, she'd sit by guys and I felt like it was just to hurt me. And so but within about six months, Phyllis, seriously, Phyllis stopped coming to church, but my parents made me go to church and this was our church. And so, uh, man, you know, we, for the next five years, there were good seasons and bad seasons, but I was a part of the youth leadership. I played drums. I was part of the band. Um, mom made me go to church. And so you just, I might've drifted from God, but I mean, no, I didn't drift too far. You know, when your parents make you go to youth and make you go to church, listen, parents, you got to make your kids go. The day and age where your kids get to decide, yeah, you, they, they, that day is, it shouldn't be when they're teenagers. In fact, I'd make them go to, in, to church every time the doors were open as long as they lived underneath your roof. Oh, you don't want to go to church? That's fine. Go, go get an apartment. Come on, somebody. Say, just consider this the payment for your rent and food. And, uh, and so that's where my whole life for the next five years, I was still in that, but I would drift in and out, didn't make all the right decisions. Now tell a little bit about what happened over the next season of your life. Yes. Um, and so looking back on it, you know, I know I had shared this before that, you know, my parents were divorced when I was five and, you know, I felt like I had a great relationship with my father. I think sometimes in life we tend to normalize things like, right. oh, this is normal. It's my normal. Right. And um, not really ever addressing the fact of my emotions and how I felt through that divorce. Even as an adult, just a few years back, um, I was always told, well, you were too young where you were, you know, you were too young. And even as an adult, I asked my, my sister and my family, and they told me the same thing. Well, you were too young. And so really, I just felt like I, I probably never got a chance to talk about my feelings. And so I internalized that. And I think it was maybe not necessarily the divorce, but the enemy just puts a seed of rejection, a right. seed of you're not good enough, yeah. a seed of abandonment there that was already there. And so I think whenever he broke up with me, it was like, oh, like this was church. Like this was supposed to right. be right. I was supposed to be safe. You know, I trusted him. So when he, when he broke up with me, um, I, w I really was hurt. Uh, and then I, of course I didn't talk to him. We talked about that. I didn't talk to him at all. I was like, don't call me. Don't talk to me. Don't mail me. Don't page me nothing, you know? Um, and then, yeah. you know, six months later we became friends, friends again, again, but obviously, you know, it wasn't the same. Um, but soon after that, I, um, started to date a guy at school. I got invited to a dance and wasn't able to date yet, but I begged my mom to go to this dance. And so it really just started the relationship that shouldn't have been started. Um, and and he, was, he wasn't a church guy. And very quickly, I began to drift from God. I started smoking and just, you know, just really not living the life that I was living. And, um, and then at 16, I lost my virginity um, to this guy. And, and so for me, it was a big deal, you know, and even dating him. He, he had a nice truck. He was popular. He played on the football team. And so coming from where you know, this seed of rejection and where right. I didn't feel good enough, he made me feel good enough. He made me feel important. I was in the in crowd. And so, um, so I lost my virginity at 16. And, uh, and then at, over some time, I just, it became heavy. I was tired of living in sin. I was tired of lying to my parents um, because I really do feel like God had deposited a seed in my heart, um, even though I was in this relationship. And so um, I... I lost my train of thought. You broke up with him. Yes. And so after... <laughs> <clears throat> that was the important part. You brought... That's the important part. <laughs> and so, but over some time, it, this relationship was heavy. And I, did, I wanted to do the right thing. Yeah. And so I did. I broke up with him. 
And I was struggling because I, I mean, I was connected to him. I had given up something that was precious to me. Yeah. And, um, and the very next day was when I saw him with another girl. And when I was told by some friends that that's what he does. He, he just goes after virgins. And so at that yeah. point in my life, I think I bought into the lie and, and I say bought into, but really it just confirmed what I felt like I had already believed. Right. And that's that I wasn't worthy of love. I wasn't worthy of sticking around. It didn't matter if I was going to church and doing good. It didn't matter if I gave up something precious to me. It didn't matter. I still wasn't worth staying for. Yeah. And, um, and so when I found that out, I broke up with him for the right reasons. But after that moment, when I found that out, my life just began a downward spiral. Yeah. And, uh, and I just said, you know what, that I will prove him, you know, I will, I will prove him wrong and I will never be hurt again. And so at 16, I started dating a 23 year old, um, to totally out of the high school scene. I started dating a 23 year old, started to drink and do drugs. Um, exposed to things that I should not have been exposed to as a 16 year old. Yeah. And then, you know, went through my high school years, um, you know, partying on the weekends, everything I did, I did away from home. And so here I am dating this 23 year old, but yet in school, I'm a normal 16 year old. I'm on the AB honor roll. I felt like the pressures of that, like living a double life. My parents had no idea. Um, you know, I just would say I'm going to a friend's house and they didn't know where I was at. Yeah. And then by the time, when I was 18, um, I graduated high school and started nursing school. And it was, by this time, you know, I was legal to go out and do things. And so I my, just, I partied even harder, um, doing drugs, doing ecstasy and cocaine. And was, I don't even know how I made it through college. But at the same time, I'm going through nursing school and I'm going through college. Um, and really just running from God, running, I, I look back on it now, and it was just a season where I was masking my, the pain. I never dealt with any of right. that rejection or that pain from my past. And so I was running from God. I was running from the pain. And then at 19, um, when I was, I was in nursing school, or almost done with nursing school at 19, I got engaged to a nightclub owner. He was 32. And, I, and all this, you know, I, I look back on it and all this, this life was normal to me, you know, and it wasn't through just kind of over time and going through counseling that I realized, you know, this, this wasn't, this wasn't normal. Right. Um, and so anyway, one night, so I had a turning point, you know, I was living this life and running and there was lots of things that I did that I was exposed to that I was shameful of. But one night uh, I had a turning point. And uh, I had kind of come to the end of myself. And so I, I almost overdosed. I had taken too much. And I remember being outside, and um, Pastor Stephanie was with me. I'm not going to throw her under the bus. but Just throw her under the bus. She might ride or die. Ride or die. Ride or die, <laughs> baby. Come on, Steph. I know you're watching. <laughs> So uh, anyway, we, uh, but she was with me outside. She was the yeah. only one. And that was what brought me comfort because I couldn't talk. I couldn't talk. I couldn't really function or move. But in my mind, I, in my, I feel like I could think. And in my mind, I was crying out to God. Like, God, just please save me. Please save me through this night. Like, I know what I'm supposed to be doing. You put that seed in my heart. Like, I know where I'm supposed to be. God, just save me through this night, and I'll straighten up. Yeah. And so it wasn't, so after that, I really felt like God took that desire from me. I felt like I didn't really want to party anymore. I wanted to go back to church. I, uh, I, so I ended up going back to church one night. I went by myself. I was so desperate. I went to a midweek service, and I cried the whole way there. I remember God was just dealing with my heart. Before I ever even stepped foot in the church, I had the AC vents on my eyeballs, like just trying to make it in the door. And then I didn't even care what the service was about. I, didn't, I don't even know what it was about. I just I could not wait for it to be over, for the altars to open. I was tired. I was tired of running from God. And, um, 
And so I, I ended the relationship. I started going back to church, the same church that we grew up yeah. in. And um, I got my own apartment, and I was getting back on my feet. I was starting to get reconnected with friends. And, yeah. um, and so I was quickly back in church, and that's when yeah. Jim and I reconnected. Yeah, I had started a Bible study at the college. Steve and I actually did. It was called Stand 318. We were seeing, man, so you can imagine, guess who? What Steve was doing, he was leading worship. Guess what I was doing? I was speaking. And, uh, <laughs> and so, you know, this is uh, him and I doing, leading this great uh, college Bible study at, at Lamar University. And it was, I mean, we're packing out the science auditorium. And all, all of a sudden, Phyllis walks in. Now, over the five years, Phyllis and I knew everything about each other. So one of the things that she didn't talk about was we stayed best friends. She would be the first person to call me. I, I would say best friends because that was a little weird with our relationships. I dated a girl for a couple of years. But let me tell you, like they were jealous of this relationship. Like, in fact, Natalie would say, you're not talking to Phyllis. Sorry, don't go meet her. And I'd be like, oh, uh, yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, we'd go talk. But there was just this friendship. So I knew what, what was happening in her life. And she would tell me, I mean, really... I didn't feel like there wasn't anything that I didn't know. And same thing with her. Like, we just, we loved each other and felt like, man, we're still going to be great friends. So when she walked in the door, I thought, oh, wow, hey, what's up? <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's so funny. When, I'll never forget when she walked in, uh, everybody just loved her, but she still looked like the club. She, she didn't clean herself up in some ways. Like, because well, I remember you. That, I didn't even know that. See, that just goes no. to show you. <laughs> Yeah, we didn't talk about it, but she didn't even have that, like the outfits and stuff, like, like she, she literally just went to church that week and said, I'm, God, I'm all in. Right. And so I remember our crew, everybody just loving on her. And then her and I, of course, we just reconnected really quickly. And uh, something that happened in my relationship was I had been dating a girl for several years. Uh, and, you know, it just, after, I'll never forget the first date I went on with her. Uh, God said, don't date her. You're not supposed to marry her. And I thought, oh, pfft. It's no big deal. And so I dated her, and two years later, I almost married this girl. And uh, I, you got to be careful. The Holy Spirit will speak to you and tell you whether it's a good or bad relationship. And the moment you compromise is the moment you start sliding down a slope you may not recover from. Um, and so long story short, uh, we were in church, and I was really hurt by her because she cheated on me with the youth pastor. She was serving in the youth group, and he was predatorial in the fact of very manipulative, very conniving. Now, we weren't doing good, and so we were headed towards a breakup. Uh, but I was pretty wounded because it's like we didn't officially say we break up yet. You know what I mean? It's like, like we weren't doing well. And so I was still... And y'all dated for three years. Two, two years, yeah, we did two years. And so, and so I was still recovering, but I'll never forget I read a book called I Kiss Dating Goodbye. Um, and so it was in this season that I said, I'm not going to date anybody until I find my, my spouse. I'm going to date you, God. And then lo and behold, about two months later, Phyllis walked into the science auditorium. And uh, we Thank just reconnected. Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, and we reconnected. And it was, it was an interesting journey. We started to hang out with friends. We didn't date again. Uh, but we drew close to each other. And then probably within four months, we were trying to figure it out throughout, you know, trying to prepare for this. Probably three, four months, we knew that that was the person for us. Like, I really, I came home, and mom, you may know better, but I remember coming home saying, I'm going to marry this girl. And my mom was, like, shocked, like, you know, and so it was kind of like, okay, okay. She's trying to affirm because that's what Jesus' sister does. And she's like... <laughs> And Phyllis had told uh, her sister that I was the one that mm -hmm. she was going to marry. It was like the same weekend, something snapped on the inside of us. Like, she is the one for me uh, for the rest of my life. And, and uh, I'll never forget, we got engaged in July. And then seven months later, we were married. In February 26, 2000, we got married. Look, oh my goodness. Oh, yeah. So that's our engagement. And so here's our wedding. Uh, and so we... Went to the engagement. It was great, man. You know, everything seemed to be going really, really well. Uh, we were living for God. People, you know, we had a huge wedding. Over 400 people showed up, and we were broke. And so it was like it was yeah. awesome because God provided the cake and the dress. And, I mean, it was just everything. My dad owned a restaurant, so we had the reception there. And it was almost like the stars aligned. Like there was just nothing that we could do wrong uh, with each other. And, and here's the whole thing. Yep. Going into the relationship, I, 
I didn't, it wasn't like I just met her and didn't know about her baggage. I knew her baggage. She's, she would call me when she was having problems. Like, so I felt like I knew all the skeletons that might would come out in the closet. And same with her. And so we both felt like we're walking into this with uh, open eyes and uh, just believing that the love is enough and Jesus is enough. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, just going back to even when I just came back to church, you know, the truth is we didn't have, well, we didn't have any premarital counseling, nope. but we didn't have, in our church, we didn't have small groups. Small so groups. not only was it not a really transparent environment, but we didn't have small groups. We didn't have freedom. There wasn't any place for me to, because, <clears throat> you know, when you say that, I think you knew about the events in my <clears throat> life. But, but you didn't know about the emotions that that's attached right. to those events. That's right. And, and that's not your fault. That's, that was because I had not even processed those emotions that attached right. to those events. And so, um, but yeah, when, so we, you know, of course, we, I get back into church not dealing with any of that. But getting back into church, when, when you and I reconnected, it was like it was meant to be. We had yep. a wonderful wedding. The preparation was fun. Everything just came together. And you're right. We, we didn't have a lot of money, but um, that was on our honeymoon. Yeah, That's but we didn't have a lot of money, but it was ble- We felt blessed. Like we yeah. really had everything that we ever wanted. Um, the wedding was everything we, you know, had or I had expected it to be, yeah. and and then some. And <clears throat> and he was everything that I expected him to be. Yeah, yeah. And so, we, but the, here's the challenge: we made promises that we didn't know how to keep. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you say for richer, for poorer, for sickness and in health, till death do us part. And the truth is, you, you have every intention, you have all the heart's desire, you have, you have everything that seems like you, what you need on the surface, but you've never experienced healing. You've never experienced authentic relationships. That's why we say we're not a church with small groups, we're a church of small groups. Yeah. You know, th- you got to have authentic relationships so that you can take off the mask with someone. Because the truth is, we didn't even take off the mask with each other at some level. You know, we knew all the events which you said it so right. well. But we, we never experienced intimate relationships with friends and people that would love us unconditionally. And, and so we didn't even know how to keep promises that we had made. And so our first year was bliss. I mean, it was awesome. It was like, wow, this is amazing. It's honeymoon. Second year was, it was, it was a, a hot mess. We, we got into, it, it was spiraling out of control very, very quickly. My dad and I opened up a restaurant, but he had another restaurant. And so... I thought we were going to do it together, but really I ended up owning this restaurant by myself in the fact that he was trying to just keep his restaurant going. And so I'm drowning. So we had had a real estate investment company. We sold some stuff and invested everything into this restaurant. I got over 30 employees. I'm only 20 something years old, Mm. early 20s. I think by now I'm 23, 30 employees, got a restaurant and uh, I'm very overwhelmed and and I'm working. And I'm frustrated. I'm frustrated at a lot of people. I'm frustrated at my dad. I was frustrated at myself. And I was frustrated at Phyllis. I'm working a lot, and she starts to tell me, look, I need more from you. You know, and she's, she starts to tell me what she needs. But the problem is I'm drowning. And so I get angry at her. Like, are you kidding? Like, we put everything into this restaurant. I need your help. I need you to give me some grace. And, and then, of course, you know how when conflict happens, intimacy stops. Oh, so now that stops. Oh, great. Well, what's the point of marriage? Come on, somebody. I mean, I'm just telling you your mentality. It's like, like, so the enemy starts to fight you, and you're just, so now you're not being intimate. You're not having needs met. And we really begin to spiral out of control, and, and anger and resentment and frustration begin to build up in my heart that really drove a huge wedge between me and Phyllis. Yes. Um, and, you know, he, the restaurant, uh, you know, I don't even think I learned to cook until probably the third or fourth year because he was there every single night. And so instead of like when I would get off work, I would go to the restaurant to have dinner yep. with him because he wasn't home and I didn't want to go home to an empty house. I wanted, you know, my expectation was we were going to do this together and it didn't, you know, it didn't feel like that we were doing it together. No. And I felt very lonely. And the truth is I abandoned you for something that you didn't really sign up for. Because even in this relationship at this time, the the restaurant was something I was all in. You know, she was still nursing and and I'm an entrepreneur and and I don't even know how much we even talked about it. 
And so the, right. the, 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 well, that's yours. We didn't even really like, the, you know, if we're not sure about it. And so I, I got to tell you, I just, I abandoned you. Well, and I think the, ex- it was important to you because the ex- success of the restaurant, which I think, you know, my you, worth, right, exactly. So you weren't going to let it die. You weren't going to mm. let it fail. Mm. And so, um, but for me, you know, I, I'm not knowing any of that. My emotion is, well, of course, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy of love because if he loved me, then he would be here. If right. he loved me, he would listen to me. If he loved me, then, you know, we would have fun together and everything like we did um, in the honeymoon phase. Right. And, you know, really, you, when you do research, honeymoon phase lasts about 18 months. And it's a real thing. We, we talk about it, but it's a real thing where really the focus of that is just on your similarities and just, it's about having fun. It's about your similarities. And then you move into that next stage and that's where you start to notice each other's differences. And there starts to be negative emotions um, and intimacy is about positive and negative, but there starts to be, there's negative emotions, which are, you know, disappointments and right. frustrations and things like that. And so um, at the same time, I was working a lot and um, at, at, in a nursing home nearby and working as a nurse. And um, there was a guy that I worked with who just came at the right time and, or the wrong time, but came, came at an appropriate time for him to tell me the right things. He was giving me things that I was missing in my marriage. Yep. Um, just being noticed. You know, at first it was just fun to be noticed and, um, and I think, you know, Jim had even said, Hey, I don't, I don't have a good feeling. I don't have a good feeling and, and processing it. I, you know, I was like, Oh no. And really it was probably because I, there, remember there wasn't anything. I could not think of one thing about me that, that was good, not a gift from God, not a talent, right. not a reason or to be worthy of love. And so I just was like, Oh, well, Oh, well, I had no idea what it was and what it meant to protect our marriage. We had, had no clue what that looked like and what that meant. And, and so that led to me having an affair in our second year of marriage. Yeah. And, and it was hard. It was really hard. And it's, it's been a huge, um, I've, it's just been a, it's been a huge process um, to, you know, just to overcome healing and, um, bring that back to restoration. Yeah. And well, and, and I want to say something, you know, Phyllis, you are so brave. Yes. Thank you, baby. Yeah. You know, I think to talk about it openly is a big deal. You know, she has to, we, we never shared this with anybody. There's five people that know this story. Jeremy Foster and Jennifer, the only ones of our close friends. Uh, and I think, you know, for me, the nervousness for you was the guilt and shame. Like even today, you know, you, you always take this risk of being vulnerable. But I feel like God has given you such courage and boldness. And so... Mm-hmm. You know, it amazes me because I think it's going to set people free. Thank you. So, and we don't have to get into the details. Um, You broke that off. And Mm -hmm. then what what I'd like to talk about is I've got five points. So we wanted to guide this conversation. We're going to be a little bit later than normal, but I wanted to guide the conversation. So, So this happens. Like, it's a mess. Like, let me tell you, like, from my perspective, and then I'll let you take it from the... Yeah, I, I just wanted to say, you know, if, like, there was a lot of awkward and cold moments. Oh, yeah. You know, like, it, like he, he was angry. Um, I, you know, I had deceived myself into believing that he didn't care about me, he didn't love me, and the truth is he did. And when he found out, I knew that. I saw the, and when I saw the pain in his eyes, I knew the damage I had done. And, and, and he left actually. And I was, I, I, he didn't tell me where he was going. He went to Steve's, thank goodness. Um, and so in Houston, and so I felt better about him going there, but he left and I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't, I thought, you know what? I might have completely screwed this up and I have no idea. I, and I had no idea what to do. 
Um, but there was a lot of, of awkward moments, a lot of cold moments, um, a lot of, you know, just allowing you to feel what you needed to feel. Yeah. Yeah, I think I was devastated. Uh, you know, it's, it's one of those moments where it's not only your spouse, but your best friend. And so for me, it was just the whole world came crumbling down. And so, but, but I want to talk through, I mean, it took us probably two years. So the first year was pretty difficult. Second year was much better. But really, there were some steps that we took. You yes, know, uh, and there was some counseling. Because counseling, dimensional journey, obviously. some things. But, but let's talk about this. One, one of the first things I want to just hit real quick in this is that uh, true repentance creates real change. Mm-hmm. And so in all of this, when it happened, I was totally devastated, totally rocked. I didn't know what to think. I remember thinking, this is the one thing in my whole life. Uh, man, anything, God, you could have done anything and I'd be good. But this is the one thing I don't know if I can even recover from. Uh, and so one of the things that really helped me work through this, not only was my family, but really was the fact of the way Phyllis responded uh, in the situation. Talk about what repentance looked like. And so, so what I saw was her willing to fight for her marriage, regardless of what it would take. Yes, um, and the truth is, is I was really repentant. I, um, you know, I, I felt like I was repentant to God. I was repentant to Him, um, and and I was willing to do whatever it took. You know, He's right. Whenever you're truly repentant, there's there's a change in behavior. There's a heart change automatically. Yeah. Like it's not really something you have to work out. Like it's just it's just done, and so um, and so. I, I was willing, I changed, I changed jobs, I changed phones, whatever it was that he needed um, to re, I had to rebuild that trust. I was the one that had broken it. And so I didn't want to lose him. I loved him and always had. And I would have, I was willing to do whatever it is that he needed. And even, even being willing to allow him to be angry and say hurtful things. And, you know, I mean, he was hurting. And so I just, I just took it and I was like, okay, you know, I, whatever it was, I was not going to leave. I wasn't going to blame. I wasn't going to, you know, make light of it. Um, I felt like I was, I mean, I was, um, Repent. Yep. Acts chapter 3 verse 19 says, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. And so, you know, in this moment, the only thing she could do is repent. My response was not up to her. And so honestly, that was probably the first three months. I didn't know if I wanted to work it out. I, I was like, no, I'm not sure I want to work it out. I think I'm done. How could I ever trust you? How could I ever love you? Um, and I think part of that is because of guilt and shame. So I think the shame is, first off, how, how could I let this happen to my marriage? How could I let something be more important to, to me than Phyllis? Second thing is a man, and, and this is, if, you, if you've ever experienced this part on a man's side, how could I not protect my wife? I mean, at the end of the day, it's a predator. Um, this is what she wasn't the first person he had had an affair with. He was married. And so then this anger really rages on the inside of how could I not? I had warning signs. I had things. And I told her, hey, I don't get a good vibe about this dude. And, but I just flippantly said, well, that's okay. And I think at some point as a man, you know, it's a failure. For me, I felt that failure as a man to protect my wife. And then, you know, then just the shame of, oh, my God, I wasn't good enough. I wasn't good enough, you know, because I've, I've always struggled with a little bit of insecurity. My dad worked a lot. My parents were married my whole life and still are. They both come to this church. Thank you, Mom. She's down here on the front. And Dad. And... But my dad worked a lot. And so I remember he missed a baseball game. And the devil planted a seed that if my dad wasn't good enough to come to the game, how could anybody be good enough to love me? So 
So I had to work through, to me, her cheating on me validated the fact that I wasn't good enough for love. Isn't that the devil's plan? You know, his schemes are, I, when I have thought about this, it's his schemes and his plans are not new. That's why in freedom, when we talk about the roots of shame and heaviness and anger and fear, it's the same lies, the same lies, which is in the reason why we wanted to tell our story. You know, our heart breaks. It's like God called us to lead this church and he knew what our path would be. And he knew, you know, and I feel like, that the lies are the same. And so for, for us, by telling this, it's like we're exposing the lies of the enemy. We're exposing that so that there can be change. Yeah, and so <clears throat> then I really, that's where, so this will all make sense if you've been here for a while. My mission statement, I'm a general organizing the greatest spiritual revolution the world has ever seen, walking intimately with God relaxed and fully confident that I cannot fail, moving in a supernatural power and authority, bringing heaven to earth. All that identity came in to my life after this was exposed. And so really God had to work on me. You are worthy of love. You are someone. So what she did doesn't define who she is. And so the enemy, he's wicked, man. He wants to steal, kill, and to destroy. Yes. Yes. And so you have to realize... So we're processing through all this. And remember this, we had no idea we'd be pastors. <laughs> yes. Surprise. 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 So it's, you know, God in his ways, but, but you know, how many people are, are impacted by this? And so once we got to this, we had to decide this. Forgiveness is a choice. Yes. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14. <clears throat> For if you forgive other people... When they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And so we had to just realize that forgiveness is a choice. She had to forgive herself. I had to forgive her. Um, and so we can keep going through. But from my perspective, there had to be a point, and I would bring it up. I mean, every little thing, I'd be, I'd just throw it up in her face and I was still, still real angry, <clears throat> but there came a point when I went through a dimensional journey that I had to release it all, and uh, I made a promise to her I would never bring it up again, and you have to, at some point, have walked through the healing, and then this event is off limits. It has to be. You can't keep going back to it, uh, and, and so even recently, we went back to it two and a half, three years ago when we launched the church. As Phyllis was discovering how to be healthier in her own personal life and relationship. And so we were with Tim and he's walking us through it and still exposing some things. And, but the truth is never again in a conversation against each other could this ever be brought up. Right. Um, and, and that's where I think forgiveness is a choice. You have to choose to live it out and to walk it out and to say, from this moment on, we're done. It's, it's not going to come back and, and haunt us. Now, I will tell you this. It doesn't mean you don't still have feelings. Uh, you know, there, there, there have been moments even throughout the last 18 and a half years where Phyllis went and did something like maybe she went and worked out or something, and a feeling gripped my heart like, oh, where's she at? Who's she with? Da, da, da. And so, but, that, but again, you got to go back to the enemy. He is a liar. Her and I have a great right. relationship, and so his key is to put these hooks in your life right. that you never get rid of so that you constantly go back to with suspicion. And, and for her and I, we have a great relationship today, uh, but we had to choose to forgive. Um, so for me, for me, it was about just choosing to forgive. It was about forgiving myself, yep. but I did want to just say that I didn't do that in the beginning. In the beginning, it was, it was all about him. It was, you know, I was yep. so thankful that he didn't leave me. I didn't even process my, I was just like, okay, whatever it is, whatever. I was so focused on rebuilding the trust. And yep. it wasn't until years later when I started, <clears throat> I could tell God was dealing with me about something and, and I just started to journal and out of that journaling, I realized that I had never forgiven myself. Right. Like I had never, f 
forgiven myself. There was a lot of shame. And, and even then, there's been more shame just in my past. But I feel like I, and I, and I talked to him about it after I journaled. And I said, you know what? I just realized, like, th this is the root of this anger and frustration is that is because I never forgave myself. To me, it was the ultimate failure, the ultimate failure. And um, so anyway, so that was, that was important as well. Yeah, well, and it's important to know healing is a process. Like mm -hmm. this, it, it took years. And, right. and here we are, I mean, even launching this church and Phyllis trying to get healthier in her own personal life and going back so to the pain of the past, which really put her into the position that she was in for all of this to happen. We are still working on ourselves, even myself, working on some of the pain from my, my, my dad. Now, so my dad loved me, but he just worked all the time. You know, just trying to provide. And here's what I know about my dad. He provided a better life for me than his dad ever did. Uh, he changed the whole course of the Kyle's family. The, the rest of the Kyle's family are drunks and alcoholics. And here we have this one set of Kyle's family that love God, pastoring church, seeing people's lives set free and changed. He changed yes. all of that. Well, and it's the enemy that brings the lies. Yeah. The person might do the action, but the enemy is the one that's saying. Yeah, that's your, right. So the point is, right. it's a process that we continue to walk through. And, and even today, we're, we're still trying to get healthier and healthier. I, th I think we, we don't reach perfection until we cross over into eternity. Uh, the, the next thing I want you to know is this. With God, restoration is possible. Mm -hmm. uh, I think apart from God, I think it's probably improbable and maybe even impossible. Uh, because God is love, God is forgiveness, God is grace, God is mercy, God is what it is that we need to show to the person that has really deeply wounded us in this way. Look at Psalm 147.3. He heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. That God heals us. God is the one that, that really, he, he loves you just like he loves your spouse. And right. so we understand that he is really for us. Uh, and then look at Matthew 19, 26, Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. So I just want you to know, may, maybe you're out there and this has happened. I want you to know with God, restoration is possible. Yes. And I wanted to just say that, you know, when you talk about with God, like it, it is possible with God, but that's because I think when we've been hurt or wounded or betrayed, then what we tend to do is just say, don't ever hurt me again. You know, like, don't ever right. hurt me again. As long as you don't hurt me again or I don't get hurt again, I'll be okay. And the truth is, man will always fail us. Right. God is the only one who it, so what we can always trust. We can put our, you know, it's like, no, man and situations, we live in this world. And in this world, there's pain and there's disappointment and there's That's betrayal. Good. And God is the one that gives us the grace to walk through that. So, so I just, yeah. Well, yeah. <clears throat> And, and I would tell you this, it takes a lot of hard work, a lot of hard work, you know, even launching this church, Phyllis and I could have said, man, we're good. We're pastors. Like, what are you talking about? Jesus is all around us and in us. And, and it was probably three years ago. We just hit a wall relationally. Uh, we just seemed to go around and around this mountain. Phyllis had been journaling. And so she asked me to go to counseling. I'm like, I'm not going to counseling. She, so she's like, go to counseling. I'm not going to counseling. And then she said, okay, well, I'm going. I said, well, go, you need it. <laughs> go. <laughs> And I was, so we were in this, and so she goes, and lo and behold, about six months later, I feel like I need to start going. And, and so it's a lot of work. And he's like, I love counseling. Yeah. Well, and I'll tell you this, there have been many a times, and you know, just be honest, and if Tim ever sees this, he'll know he's our, he's our counselor. Uh, there have been many a times Phyllis and I have walked out of his office either mad at him or mad at each other, mm -hmm. frustrated. I mean, there's been times where we walk out and I'm like, oh, World War III is about to happen. Like, I just feel it. Like something. And it did. And it did. Like somebody said something. And, and so what's my point? Here's the deal. Left unresolved, that conflict will come to surface. Yeah. So whether it's in the counselor's office getting help or it's in a conversation with your spouse, you got to know you cannot leave those, those things that are underneath the surface unhealed and unresolved. They will always present themselves. And it's easy to do when you're busy or even in church. Sometimes I feel like yeah. it's really easy to hide in right. church because we can jump on the dream team. We can serve. We're yep. doing all the right things. Yep. You know, just like whenever I got back in church, you're doing all the right things, but yet still hurting and broken right. and never really addressing the whys behind some of those emotions. Oh, yeah. You come in yeah. with a smile on your face and your heart is broken. And, and Which is good, is, but just don't stay there. Don't stay there. Right. Well, another thing is you got to get in small groups. 
I'm, not, I'm telling you, you got to get in a relationship with people that say, man, if your marriage is on the rocks, find a couple that you could say, man, we're headed towards a divorce. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, if, if you're struggling, if, if something is wrong and you're like, man, we're stuck. That's why I love Jeremy and Jennifer. I can't tell you how many times we've called. I mean, we didn't need a small group and I didn't need my shrink. I needed my best friend. Mm -hmm. I need Phyllis to be with someone that was safe. And we had to say, man, we're struggling with this. Like, this is something that's hard. And so you've got you to gotta find those godly, healthy relationships. And then I think we need to know a healthy marriage is the result of healthy, two healthy individuals. Like, healthy marriages don't just happen. they yes. got to have two healthy individuals that are whole that make a whole marriage. Right. And so, and, and, and I think it's good, too. Let, let me say this, and Phyllis, you can chime in or not. I'll never forget when, when Jeremy told me and Phyllis set us down and we were talking and he said, listen, health is not a 50-50 thing. Like in a relationship, there's someone that's more unhealthy than the other. Sometimes you're a 70-30 or an 80-20. And, and I think that's okay. At the moment, you've got to own who is, who's carrying this right now and recognize I've got to do some work. But look, that doesn't leave you out. You've still got to do work too because there's been pain that's been caused in this relationship. And this is what I know. If we'll work together, we can get to healthy together. And so we realize that, man, health is because we are healthy. Yes. And I think whenever it's real easy to blame your spouse. Oh, and so yeah. when, I was, when I was feeling these negative emotions, really it was the Holy Spirit causing, I mean, you know, the enemy wants to come and tell you the lies, but really in God's goodness, he allows those things to happen. He allows friction. He allows rejection. He allows those things because he's bringing stuff out of you a lot of times. Yeah. And he's ex wanting to expose the enemy. And that's exactly what was happening. I think it was just, it was our commitment mm -hmm. to not giving up. Like, yeah. it doesn't, okay, we're going to go back again. Yeah. And there were times whenever we didn't talk, like talk, like we would talk about the kids or talk about function stuff, just but really didn't dive into the deep conversation until we were in counseling again because yeah. it was too painful. And so I can honestly say that through that, we have a great marriage. We like, do. I love you. I love you too. And I am so She's my thankful. Best I, coming through the hard seasons, I just, I love this man more than anything in the world. And he is my best friend. And we have learned to laugh together at our crazy life and things that we used to get upset about because we didn't know who we were and we took them personally. Now that we're healthier, we can laugh about it. You know, it's like, God's design for marriage is good. Yeah, yeah. It's good. And I'm thankful for you. Oh, I'm so thankful for you. You know, it's, uh, we went, we went road race car this week. Did you guys <sighs> see it on Facebook and all that? So, <laughs> so, you know, it's fun to have your best friend. I think for us, all this come back up about three years ago. And even this relationship series feels like it's time. I'm like, are you sure? <laughs> Like, will they love us? Will they accept us? And so, but even, <laughs> you know, so the last couple months, we were talking about it and We just said, no hidden spots. Let the church know everything, anything. I think when we expose the enemy, I know when we expose him, it not only sets us free, but it sets others free. <clears throat> you know, so we're, we're at a unique place. I do want to say this, and then I, and then I, I feel like God's going to do something. We have to diligently protect our marriage. So whether this has ever happened before or not, you have to be on guard. Even in today's culture and society, I mean, affairs are glamorized. I mean, you've got 50 shades, you've got, 
And, and in the moment of the movie, I mean, it's awesome. It's passionate. Like, like honestly, your need is getting met at some ex, in some level. That's why. But the results are catastrophic. The enemy's coming in to try to steal and destroy the very thing that God supernaturally placed together. And so we've got to be diligent. We've got to safeguard our marriage. We've got to maintain healthy relationships, not only with each other, but with other people. Look, guys, you should never be alone with a girl. I mean, that's just, that's just with girls, you should never be alone with God. You don't go out. You don't drive in cars. You don't eat lunch. I don't care if you're a professional or not. You have to eat in groups. You have to go out in groups. And, and one of the things Phyllis and I really learned, and, and ever since all that happened at the very beginning, we tell on other people all the time. Uh, we do it to this day. If I ever feel uncomfortable, I say, hey, Phyllis, I felt uncomfortable. Something felt off right here. I just want you to be aware of it. Who was she? <laughs> What's this? <laughs> or same thing with her. She's like, hey, Jim, I met this guy. I was a little bit uncomfortable. Like, I just, I, I don't, he, didn't, he wasn't hitting on me. He might have been hitting on me. I mean, we just, we tell on the other people. Why? Because I don't want there to be anything that could later come out and sabotage our marriage. The other thing that we learned was if your spouse has a feeling about someone and you don't, you, you better listen. listen to your spouse. You listen. There's something that God placed on the inside of your spouse that, you know, and, and we can feel like, well, nobody hit on me. Or Here's the thing. They're married. Huge, huge. Because women immediately put the guard down and say, well, he's married. I'm married. Right. We're good. Maybe I could just share. No, no, it's a huge trap. Don't do it. And so if your spouse ever says, hey, right. look, I don't feel good about him. Something's not right. I mean, you just got to make sure that you're listening. Even if you don't feel it or believe it, you just trust your spouse. Yeah, yeah, you just yeah. got to say his word. And then I think, you know, the, the last thing, you just got to invest in your spouse. You know, I said it a couple of weeks ago. When you have an affair, you go to great lengths to hide it. You text, you show up, you run to be, I mean, all this great lengths of lies and deception. What would happen to our marriages if instead of putting our energy towards that, we actually put it towards our spouse? We bought our spouse flowers. We sent our spouse great texts. We we, we invested in the relationship, listening to them and, and affirming them. And so just making sure that we never stop investing in the person that honestly, you married them because you love them, because they are your number one. They are the person that God has called you to live your life with. And so never stop investing in them. You That's want to good. say anything else? Um, I think... I think we, we had, there's just so much information. I feel like there's a million lessons from our marriage and my life. And yeah. um, we were going to share this and, and didn't. But I think one of the most important things is just um, when you talk about being intimacy, intimate with your spouse, which intimacy, intimacy is, you know, is the good and the bad. And right. it's sharing your thoughts and feelings and being able to receive it. Um, is just knowing yourself. That's good. You know, I think in the beginning, like I had no idea. I couldn't even have communicated my emotions or things because I had no idea. Like I hadn't worked through any of that. And so I just think that there's a lot of power because in order to love well and be loved, you have to be aware of your emotions. Yeah, that's so good. So. Yeah, so the discovery of who you are, you know, every one of us ought to be on that journey because every one of you have got hooks that the enemy has hung lies on. Yep. And so you got to expose that hook like, that's not true. Filter. My dad loved me. People love me. God, so, so then when the devil tries to hang a hook like nobody loves you, it's like, no, no, that's not true. Everybody loves me. Like, yes, a lie. So that hook has no more power. So you got to expose those hooks in your life. That's now, good. I want to do this. Can we just pray? I feel like that God is moving in the life of, so, you know, I, I believe everyone. I think, number one, if you're not married, it's a great lesson. Let our life be a lesson for you uh, and so that you, you don't have to experience it. And I, I think for some of you in here in this place, you've experienced the pain of infidelity, uh, whether you were the person that had the affair or the one that the affair was perpetrated on you that at the end of the day there is deep pain and what I want to pray is that God would take the pain away that that you wouldn't just go through the motions but that there would be real healing in your life and and healing comes when you really build relationships so I would encourage and I encourage all get into a small group get in a marriage small group I've already asked people to start launching these marriage small groups it's 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 imperative the, the other thing is this look if, if that's you and you've had an affair an affair happened to you uh, 
go to a counselor. Like, we want to pray with you, but we're not licensed counselors. Right. Like, we're spiritual guides. We'll pray over you, and we have helped dozens and dozens of people that have experienced this. But I'm going to see you one or two times, and now you know everything, so you probably heard all the advice I would give you. You just got to go to a counselor. You got to go to someone that's professional that can help you walk through it, I believe. Uh, and then this morning, I think we just got to pray that God would deposit healing and, and hope and health and restoration in your heart. Um, I also think there's some other people in here. I think there's someone in here that's had an affair, but nobody knows. I would encourage you this. Ask God to speak to you. I think at, at the deepest level, you have to come out and you have to share now, I don't know who you have to share it with. I'm not going to tell you that. But if it stays locked inside, you will forever be a trap, trapped and a prisoner of your past. Doomed to repeat it because you've never experienced the healing from what caused it. And so I'm going to pray for you because I'll tell you, it ain't easy. When Phyllis and I went through this, it is tough. I can't tell you, he or she, your spouse is going to stay with you. They don't have to. You know, the Bible says you don't have to. It's the one offense the Bible legitimizes divorce. Mm -hmm. It does. And I tell people all the time, come in and say, she doesn't have to stay with you. He doesn't have to stay with you. I can't make that decision. Why? Because you have to live it out. If you cannot forgive the offender, it'll never work. So, so I, you say, well, will it work? Will God restore it? I don't know. I'm just telling you, you can't live with that inside for the rest of your life. It'll eat away at you the rest of your life. And then I, I want to pray for a third group. If your marriage is in a bad place, hadn't happened yet, but you can tell you've been flirting a little bit, talking a little bit, your heart's drawing someone else, we're going to pray that that stops. You've got to cut it off because the truth is that other person's not who you want anyway. It's your spouse. And the enemy has lied to you, and I'm going to ask the enemy to expose the lie. I'm going to ask God to expose the lie of the enemy. So let's just pray over those this morning. Phyllis, is there anyone that you, why don't you start us off and then I'll pray after that. Okay. Father, I just, God, I pray, God, that you would just use our story, Father, to minister to hearts and minds of people here today. God, I speak to those who have walked through betrayal like we talked about today. Yes. God, I pray that you would give them the grace to walk through counseling, to visit those painful places. Yeah so yeah. that there can be freedom. I declare yes. and just command that every lie of the enemy yes. would be exposed so there would be freedom. God, I pray for, for restoration in these marriages, God. I thank you, Father, for what you're doing in the lives of this church as individuals, yes. God. I pray that that, Lord, that you would walk them through the process, God, like only you can do. That you would bring healing yes. where there's pain. That yes. you would bring peace where there's fear, God. Fear of being rejected. We cancel that in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that first and foremost, that they would recognize their true value. Lord, that they are loved and valued because they are made in the image of you, yes. God. Because they are fearfully and wonderfully made. And God, that you have plans to prosper us and not to harm us. Thank you, Father. And God, I just, I pray this over any marriages, Lord, that have, have, are experiencing or have experienced this infidelity. God, I, I pray for your supernatural grace yes. as they walk this out. Yeah.